I am full of the joys of another beautiful summer day at the end of July and I have just finished reading the last of my one star review picks that I made in June. Tune in to find out what I thought of all of them and what I'm going to be reading next in August. <music> Hey everyone, it's Ray and welcome to my little bookish corner of the world that is growing pretty much every single day, at least it has done in July so far. I am here today to talk about my July one star review picks. Yep, I'm going to be picking some more names or quotes from this jar at the end of the video and picking those books off the shelf as I return the books that I read in July, either to the unhaul shelf or to their little home, wherever that may be. So last month, I picked three books from the jar to read in July. They were Sorrow and Bliss by Meg Mason, Tress of the Emerald Sea by Brandon Sanderson, and Fair Rosaline by Natasha Solomon. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you what I thought about all of those three books. And if I thought that the one star reviews I picked them on were in any way fair or not. Remember, my personal opinion, you are free to disagree with me and let me know in the comments why you do so. The first book I read, and I, <laughs> July was a bit of an odd reading month for me and I will be getting into that in my <laughs> rundown, my wrap up of July itself. But it took me a long time to get to all three of these books. In fact, I have read them in the last five days. Two of them I read Friday through Saturday and I'm recording this on Sunday the 28th of July. So yeah, if that's any indication, you're going to know how much of a struggle it was for me to pick these books up, even not taking into account the reviews that went with them. So the first book I picked up was Fair Rosaline by Natasha Solomons. This was recommended so many times and the only reason I picked it up was because I'd seen it everywhere and people were talking about how amazing it was and how wonderful they felt the retelling was and how they felt this particular character had been done a disservice in the Shakespeare play. Before I get to the actual book itself, I am gonna say, Rosaline barely pays, plays any role in the Shakespeare play. She's got a couple of lines where she is mentioned by other characters, namely Mercutio and Romeo and their friends. And yeah, that's what I'm going to say on that. And I did study Shakespeare for a considerable period of time at university. I'm not going to say I know everything about it because I will admit Romeo and Juliet is not my favourite play by him, by any stretch of the imagination. I far prefer The Tempest, and I will kind of mention that when it gets to Tress of the Emerald Sea, though I'm not going to touch on it here. Fair Rosaline, Natasha Solomons, it came out, I believe, last year, 2023. And the review I picked it on was this one. Why must retellings always make villains out of the original story's characters. And I apologize for how straight this is. I am gonna point out one tiny thing. I have an astigmatism. My glasses kind of repair it, but I can't see a straight line to save my life, which may explain why I think my camera might be crooked, but it may well not be. Ignore that, I'm so sorry. Anyway, so why must retellings always make villains out of the original story's characters? The summary for this book is, I'm going to go into this because I think it plays an important role. The first time Romeo Montague sees young Rosaline Capulet, he falls instantly in love. Rosaline, headstrong and independent, is unsure of Romeo's attentions, but with her father determined that she join a convent, this handsome and charming stranger offers her the chance of a different life. Soon, though, Rosaline begins to doubt all that Romeo has told her. She breaks off the match, only for Romeo's gaze to turn towards her young cousin, 13-year-old Juliet, Gradually, Rosaline realises that it's not only Juliet's reputation at stake, but her life. With only hours remaining before she will be banished behind the nunnery walls, Ro will Rosaline save Juliet from her Romeo, or can this story only ever end 
one way. Now, we all know how the the play originally ends with our star-crossed lovers, both deceased. This book takes the story of Romeo and Juliet and makes it dirty. Can I say that? Yeah, it makes Romeo into a, um, a predator. It makes Friar Lawrence into his willing um, <laughs> accomplice and makes the whole thing into some obscene <sighs> abduction ring that has um, abandoned lovers turning up pregnant, being poisoned and dying, and Rosaline as the only person who can save her cousin because she's seen through Romeo's act. I can't... <sighs> I can't even begin to explain how much I disliked this book. I think part of my dislike has it has to do with one of the author's own lines that says, as a teenager, I believed it was the doomed love between Juliet and Romeo that made the story a tragedy. Rereading the play as an adult alongside my sister who works in child protection, I understand it very differently. The real tragedy is that none of the adults protects the children. The Capulets are all culpable. Like all groomers, Romeo has a pattern, a predilection for young girls, and Juliet is the youngest of them all. I have a problem with the whole book anyway. I felt that it was sensationalist for the sake of it. And if you didn't like these particular characters, why use a character that literally has no, barely any presence in the play to make a point? And... I agree with this review. If you don't like the story, don't reread it, don't rewrite it. This book is being unhauled and I cannot wait to get it off my bookcase. That's how bad it was. It was, it, it deserved a one star review and I personally gave it a one star review and went into it in a little bit more detail why I felt this way. It was not only because of exactly what this reviewer said, and I don't know who it was because I literally went in and picked them at random. Um, but yeah, I, I don't agree that this was a good book. I think it was unfortunate. And as for the author determining that they are going to write a the only true version of Cleopatra, please read the memoirs of Cleopatra by Margaret George. If you want to read a true Cleopatra where she is... In the master of her own destiny, The Memoirs of Cleopatra by Margaret George. Yes, it is a very, very chunky book, but it is fantastically written and a really good version of historical events as they are portrayed, not only ignoring Shakespeare because, <laughs> yeah, um, he wasn't doing a factual thing. He was creating entertainment, but also because this uses archaeological evidence and everything else in order to write this book. So, yeah. Don't read whatever this is going to be. Read Margaret George's The Memoirs of Cleopatra. It is fantastic. So there's Fair Rosaline, the first of the one stars. And yes, I agree with it. The next one is Brandon Sanderson's Tress of the Emerald Sea. And the one star review for this one. Yeah. The one star review for this was. I can't do it anymore. I surrender. I literally hate this book. This was one of Sanderson's um, secret projects he wrote during the um, pandemonium. I'm going to say that. And yeah, he actually says, I started writing this in secret as a novel just for my wife. Uh, she urged me to share it with the world and alongside three other secret novels with the support of readers worldwide, it grew into the biggest Kickstarter campaign of all time. And that is the summary that is actually on the back of the, on the front of the book. The back of the book, which is unusual for hardback, by the way, the only life Tress has known on her island home in an emerald green ocean has been a simple one, with the simple pleasures of collecting cups brought by sailors from faraway lands and listening to stories told by her friend Charlie. But when his father takes him on a voyage to find a bride and disaster strikes, Tress must stow away on a ship and seek the sorceress of the deadly midnight sea. 
Amid the spore oceans where pirates abound, can Tress leave her simple life behind and make her own place sailing a sea where a single drop of water can mean instant death? It was poetry on the page. It was beautifully written, as I have come to um, learn with Sanderson's books. But like the other two of his um, secret projects uh, that I have read, Yumi and the Nightmare Painter and the um, Frugal Wizard's Guide to... Uh, Frugal Wizard's Handbook for Surviving Medieval England. Yeah, I had to look it up because the title is very, very convoluted. I didn't find this had the same um, pulling power for me personally as um, his... Skywood series which I'm anxiously awaiting the fourth book in paperback because I have the other three in paperback and I didn't want a hardback but that's a personal thing and I think all readers have a weird a few weird proclivities when it comes to how they collect their books if I start a series in paperback I want to continue it that way if I start it in hardback I will continue it that way as well and I've been lucky with a few books where I've been able to do that but with Skywood I waited too long because I had them on ebook originally and I found that ebook is a little bit harder for me to read these days. Anyway, Tress is an intriguing character and she is driven by her love of Charlie, the Duke's son, to take on an adventure and for me there were elements of The Tempest, hence mentioning it earlier on when I was talking about Fair Rosaline, but also it was a pirate adventure, it was um, seeking out independence and it was about growth. However, I found certain elements of it were a little bit convoluted. The narrator confused me because there is, most of the book is written as though it's third person. However, there is a first person narrative that original, initially is sort of like, this is a little bit jarring. And as you get into the book, it becomes even more so, or at least I found it to be that way. It's not one I'm going to unhaul because it completes a set. But it isn't one I think I will be revisiting in the near future. It is, it's, as I said, it's beautifully written. It is like poetry. It is, um, he has got a way of painting pictures with his words. Evocative, stunning. Um, he definitely does know how, he is a good writer. But I do feel that this was probably because it was written in such a short period of time and it wasn't originally meant to have a wider audience, maybe it would have benefited from a few rewrites, perhaps. It was kind it, it's not a vanity project, I'd never say that, but it does feel a bit more personal. And sometimes that doesn't translate well to a wider audience as these books, for me, didn't anyway. So that is Tress of the Emerald Sea. I don't think it deserved the one star review because I didn't find myself hating it. I think that it, I think I rated it three stars and rated it 3.25 on Storygraph because you have that flexibility, thank you. I needed that flexibility, I really did. Um, but it wasn't one that really grabbed me and made me read. I think I started it one day and finished it like three days later because it didn't pull me to finish it in quickly. Though Fair Rosaline I finished in a uh, literal afternoon. I started it at about 1.30 in the afternoon and finished it by four. So I, I was rushing that one. I just wanted it over and done with. The final book that I picked off the shelf was Meg Mason's Sorrow and Bliss which I have had on my bookcase since 2021, as can be determined by this little non-removable sticker. I hate the fact that I couldn't remove it and I apologise if you could hear that. That is my massively inconsiderate neighbour who sits outside and revs the engine of his motorcycle. But anyway, um, this book, yeah, it's been on my shelf for three years and the review that came with this one was... Unfortunately, I can't get back the amount of time and energy I took to read and stress about finishing this book. Ah, uh, yeah. I didn't rate this book one star like this reader did. However, as someone who has experienced serious mental health illness issues since they were 11, 12 years old, 
I found some of the book to be a minor cop-out. I'm not sure if that's because the author has experience in mental health issues and didn't want to discuss them very personally, but there are certain things in here in this book. I mean, it's the indicator on the cover actually shows despair. And the main character, Martha, is going through trauma. Apparently, the minute she turns 17, her brain just clicked and it didn't st it stopped working the way it had done previously and she set was set into a morass of absolute despair it jumped up and down as depression does quite often tend to do and it's not until her marriage is on the ver her second marriage for that matter is on the verge of breaking down close to her 40th birthday that she gets a diagnosis that she was previously given but her mother discarded because she didn't want her daughter suffering from a stigma. I can see where this could happen. I can honestly say that a lot um, from personal experience parents don't necessarily want you to be associated with the stigma of a mental health disorder because especially during the 80s when this kind of maybe have based late 80s early 90s it was very difficult for people to comprehend mental health issues the way they do today they are they are far more open-minded if you went to see a therapist especially in the UK back in the 80s or 90s oh dear yeah it, it was just it was unheard of it was a luxury for people who could afford that kind of thing it was very considered very Californian but this character goes to a psychiatrist and she gets a diagnosis and she is angry at everybody, angry at the world. And it's only at that point that I felt myself opening up and understanding our, our main character, Martha, far better. Previous to that, it felt very much like a, a tale of self-pity and I was incredibly close to DNFing because it had taken me a considerable period of time to slog through the first 80% of the book. But then I got to that moment and all of a sudden I felt the tears and I could sympathise with and identify with her character far better. And I do think that sometimes, especially with this particular subject matter, it's important to be able to do that. So when I found myself identifying with her more, that's the moment when I started to not enjoy the book, but understand it. And I think that's important. So I didn't give Meg Mason's Sorrow and Bliss a one star review like this reader did. I gave it a 2.75 because the vast majority of the book was a slog. But that moment when everything switched over and she finally started to realise that she had to take some responsibility for things that had happened because they weren't happening to only her. All the things, all of her behaviours, many of which she didn't have control over, were also being inflicted upon people who loved her and cared for her. And eventually you do reach a point where exhaustion sets in and you're not the only person going through this. And when she started to realise that is when the book changed for me. So because of that, I gave it 2.75. I don't think I was being generous. I think that I was being fair. And for the time being, this is probably going to stay on my shelf and I might revisit elements of it again at a later date. So those were my three. And now I'm going to pick three more because I'm, I'm all about punishing myself with books that may not be great. But then who can say what's a good book and what isn't? It's personal, it's subjective, and to be honest, you never know what you're going to get. I mean, I could pick any book off the shelf thinking, oh, that looks incredible. I'm looking at a couple right now that I can't wait to read, but it could be absolutely horrific for all I know. <laughs> okay, so pick number one. God. It's a purple edged book. Number 13 there was nothing I enjoyed about it except that the cover was pretty. And talk about damning with faint praise there. So what's book number 13? Moved to a phone this time because look at that. 
because it's easier to Ithaca by Clare North, which is okay, move things around. I haven't purchased the sequel to this yet because I wanted to read the first one and see if it was good. I know several people have enjoyed it. So there you go, Ithaca by Claire North. It is a mythology book. So it's, I think that's going to be, I would say that's the first mythology book I've read in ages. That is a huge lie because I've just this month read uh, Babylonia, which is kind of mythology, but also historical. And yeah, so that's book number one. Book number two. The more, the closer I get to the bottom of the barrel when it comes to these books, Oh, no, I'm not going to pick another one in that thing. So, okay. Book number two. This is a green edged book. Okay. Completely whack. It's giving. And it was all just a dream. One star is generous. Okay. Book number 53, so that's quite close to the end. I'm, uh, am I right to be nervous? The Murder Game by Tom Hindle. Okay, so, oh, I've just purchased the sequel to this one. So it's going to be interesting to see. That's The Murder Game by Tom Hindle. Um, like the cover though. So, yeah, it's a cozy crime, so or cozy mystery. So that's going to be another interesting one. And that's going to be fun to put back on the shelf when <laughs> I finish the video, because they stay on the shelf until I get to them. And that could be as it was this month, right at the very end of the month. I'm not going to pick another green. That's another green. Here we go, a blue. I don't know whereabouts this is in the, the counting schedule. Okay, I seem to be picking books. I mean, two of them, they're both in genres I love, but the reviews are horrific. Lessons to be learned, book number 35. Sometimes you can trust other reviewers, even though it does sound like a book you should like. Number 35. Oh God. The Kingdom is a Golden Cage by Lily Inkwood. Right, I believe that this is one of my special editions, so I am going to have to legitimately search because, as you can see, the special editions are with the, with the um, sprayed edges facing outward. And I think that this is one of the darker ones, so it's possibly over on the other side. But I will have to pick that one out and find, well, I'm gonna to have to find it first. So that is The Kingdom is a Golden Cage by Lily Inkwood. And I have no idea what the sprayed edges look like. Oh, I do have an idea. Here we go. The Kingdom is a Golden Cage by Lily Inkwood. And I believe that this is a locked library special edition. Yes, it is. So it's absolutely stunning to look at with really pretty sprayed edges. So I can understand by why somebody would say, well, actually they said that about the murder game, but yeah, it's a very pretty book to look at. And I think that it might be romantic -y. So I've got three very different genres here, as I did last month. I have got romantic -y, cozy mystery, and mythology. This is about um, what happens to Penelope in Ithaca while Odysseus is on his journey back from the Trojan War. So it's going to be three very interesting reads and I think that they're quite chunky as well. Well two of them are. So those are my three books for next month. Have you read any of those three books? I'd be very interested to hear if you have. I'm very interested to hear what your opinions are on the other three that I have read as well. So let me know. And if you haven't subscribed already, please don't forget to do so. Click that thumbs up button and let me know what you think. 
and I will be speaking with you very, very soon as I am going to be doing a review side by side of Agatha Raisin and the Quiche of Death, the book and the TV episode which launched the Agatha Raisin TV series because the votes are talking. Until next time, bye. Oh, 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 o